Welcome everybody to the Kubernetes SIG network meeting for Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Tim, you are up with issue triage. Howdy doody. Uh, so I did some initial triage, pinged a few of the ones that hadn't really been updated since two weeks ago. Uh, and so I have a whopping five for us to look at today. Um, and I also have a tab open a pull request, which has, let's say somewhat more than five for, for us to look at if we, have the extra time today. So uh, starting with the most recent, uh, IPVS, something about terminating and uh, having uh, black holes while pods are being recycled uh, through the backends. Uh, they, user says it works great with IP tables, totally bombs with IPVS. Somebody wants to take a look? This is and you cycling in a large territory, always. <laughs> but they are not here, so. Should I just assign it to Andrew? And Lars. Lars. Uh, oh, Lars? Is you a... Uh, you yeah. OK. I hope they... Uh, this was a fun one to read. They, they claim that they have two, three containers within a pod that talk to each other on localhost. And when they install a network policy, uh, then their localhost connections fail. Which plugin? They did not say. So that was my question. And um, I thought I would just bring this up because I thought it was a really fun bug report. Um, it's one of those that can't possibly happen, but it probably is. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens by next time. We, we have a, uh, a flake that has been open for a while, catching up with the end of it. It looks like uh, it was a reference to uh, external traffic policy local. Uh, Jay, are you here? No? Well, he's been active on it, so I'm going to go ahead and assign it to him. Didn't stick. We have a an older flake that Antonio you were on. Yeah, this is I was I was working with Voltage and we found that a lot of tests were waiting for pot running just in Santa Barbara. Um, so they were waiting for running and they need to wait for running and ready. And uh, we were changing a lot of this condition. So assign it to me because. It's already on you. Yeah. OK. Uh, and then this one is a, a really old one, but I left it in the queue uh, anyway, because I thought it was maybe worth discussing today if we had time. Uh, this is the old uh, replace update does not work for services because of the immutable fields in cluster IP. Uh, and um, it's an old bug report that we've heard many, many times. Um, though, you know, there's a there's a reasonable argument for for maybe we should fix it. So I started working through it a little bit this week of what we would have to change and what the implications are. Um, it's kind of a an, I don't know. It's kind of a fun problem to me. Like, it's not going to make a whole difference to the world, but uh, it seems like a fun problem to to fix once and for all. Um, if we can possibly do it. Um, so it's while it's assigned to me, I thought we could discuss it if we have uh, extra time. And uh, it's a, kind of a long one to read, so I won't read it all here. Um, go ahead. This is the one that conflates the port or do something with the keys or something like that. Uh, no, I mean, this particular issue is, I guess, uh, Helm is using uh, put instead of post. And when they put twice, it fails. Because, because the, the way we do allocations, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't backfill the IP address into a subsequent put is, is the issue. Um, so we could basically turn put into like a small patch by saying, but this was an allocated field, so we'll bring it forward and, and apply it. Um, 
but uh, we don't we don't currently do that. Uh, and well, I don't want to hijack the. You wanted to talk, right? I have a few questions. So. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, but that's it for issue triage. There, there were not very many issues filed in the last cycle. So let's um, do whatever is on the agenda. And then if we have time left, we can come back to these or, or PR triage. All right, uh, we do have some agenda items now. So Lockie, you're up. May, who put me on the agenda? Put you on the agenda to talk about Signet's work in the enhancement space because I think that's worth talking about. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I was. I just did a quick uh, take of stock because I was looking in one twenty one release, and uh, there are ten actually tracked enhancements coming out of Signet work, which is fantastic. And I know that anybody who's worked on enhancements, they've changed the process a little bit in one twenty one and made the uh, production readiness review mandatory now which adds a little bit more work so thank you to everybody who's reviewed things and got that in but that's 15 percent of all enhancements um only second to node which always has a, a big barrage of them but i just you know i just was flabbergasted by the amount of work happening in, in signet so i was like you know con congratulations that's head and shoulders i think above most other sigs um and it's across all areas load balances endpoint slice going to stable dual stack going to beta. There's a whole bunch of things in there, which is great progress. So kudos to SIG network. And this is a lovely, well-oiled SIG. I attend a lot of SIGs. There. So kudos wow. to you all. I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that we're lovely and well-oiled because I spent a bunch of time today trying to figure out how to um, get what I feel like the sand out of the machinery. Um, it, it feels like we could be a lot more well-oiled than we are um, so first, I want to echo, yes, tons of uh, awesome, great work that happened. Uh, I was very busy reading CAPS in the last few weeks. Um, and so thanks to everybody who was uh, bombarding me with them. Uh, they all look really good, and, and um, I'm very happy with them. Uh, I, I should put it on the agenda. I'd like to talk about what we want to do as a SIG for like procedural stuff, whether we want to use project boards and what hoops are we willing to set up for ourselves to jump through in order to get the well-oiled machine to be more well oiled -ier. It has been added, Tim. Awesome, thank you. All right, Rob, you're up for cool. failed update endpoint slice. Yeah, this is not particularly new. I just, uh, this seemed like a good time to actually cover it and see if there were ideas out there. Uh, if you've used a Kubernetes cluster with endpoint slice controller enabled and you have a non-trivial amount of endpoints, uh, you have probably seen uh, an event on services that is failed to update endpoint slices. And this event is annoying and it, uh, it's, there, there's open source issue related to this. It does not necessarily mean anything broke but I would love to find a better solution to this. Uh, the endpoint slice controller works very similarly to the endpoints controller in that uh, there's a sync service uh, command that, or loop basically that runs through anything, any, anytime anything around a service changes, it updates any endpoint slices it thinks needs to change. The problem is all of those updates are based on the informer cache and the informer cache can get out of date. And so what we're seeing when, when, when those events come through is that the endpoint slice controller tried to update stale endpoint slices based on its copy of the informer cache. Uh, I linked to a PR where I tried to kind of delay those syncs until we sort of kind of thought we were, we had an up-to-date version. Uh, so you basically watch for endpoint slice updates to come in in the informer cache that match what you previously tried to do. But sometimes those can get merged together. And so you don't always get all the events you expected to get. Uh, I, I've talked to various people, API machinery, et cetera. It doesn't seem like there's an amazing answer here, but unfortunately that's left us in a place where there's no amazing answer. So we have no answer. And it feels like we should, try to do something. I just don't know what it is. Uh, the, 
the error message, the event is annoying. It doesn't, I don't, as far as I can tell, nothing actually is broken here. It's just endpoint slice controller is doing more work than it needs to because it's update, trying to update before it has a complete picture. And then in addition to that, users are seeing these events that seem problematic. And our answer is, well, no, just don't worry about them, which is not great. So any ideas at all would be great. I'd love to get some kind of fix in for the 121 cycle, but I, I've been struggling to find a good one. How terrible would it be load wise to do a fetch on your first failure to get a fresh copy and not post the error until you try that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there, there's a, a fix that's somewhat related to that. Um, I, I think that's probably a good idea. What you would have to do. I don't really know what these, so let's say that we do a fetch and we see, we see that the endpoint slices that are outside of the cache are newer than the ones in our cache. Do we then trigger a sync with those? Like, I, I think what that would mean is you'd be doing once every, you'd be doing one sync based on the cache and then one sync based on API call a lot. So you basically be bypassing the cache uh, a lot of the time based on how frequently the, but, which is better than surfacing an error every time. Uh, but I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I need, to, I need to think about that more. Can you, do we, do we understand why the cache is stale and in conflict? Yes. Yeah, so I, uh, we respond to lots of different events. So we, we trigger a sync service anytime an endpoint slice changes that we didn't expect or a service changes or mo more specifically, if a pod changes. So what's likely to go going to be happening is a pod backing a service triggers a, a sync service call, like basically throws that service in the queue. And that does not mean that our, we have an up-to-date version of endpoint slices in the cache. If we were in a more simple model where the thing triggering the sync was the same as what we were updating, we wouldn't have this issue. But because there's so many unrelated things that can trigger this sync, we don't know that what we're trying to update is actually up to date in the cache. And that's because the update for the, for the thing that we're trying for this slice is further down the queue like, or like something happened and you don't have it at all. I, I think it's just, it's just not, it, it has not been reflected in the cache yet. Uh, so it, it could be that, so the, so one option is just to delay the frequency uh, with which we can sync a service, uh, like a, a specific service. But what could happen is you, you update all endpoint slices for a service, and as that's happening, a pod update happens. And so right away, sync, that service gets queued again. And those endpoint slice updates have not made it to your copy of the cache yet. Uh, another option is to maintain a local cache for the endpoint slice controller of endpoint slices, but that feels very prone to other bugs. Uh, yeah, I think scaling. You, you're just going to have problems yeah. putting watches everywhere and going around the informer and basically it's not scaling, putting more load on the API server. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I, fundamentally, the error here just means we did a bunch of work and then we got a conflict on one of the slices. One or more, yeah. So we, we have, have now, trying. We, have a, we have a partial state, right? So we've written some of our slices, but not all of them. Yeah, yeah, and which so is just, not like, and we this just throw it, do it again, right? Exactly, and so this eventually resolves. I, I've I have yet to see a case where this is constantly in an error state, but 
It's relatively frequent, especially in big rolling updates where lots of endpoint slices are changing and you're calling that sync service a lot, uh, where you see this event over and over again. And it will it eventually solves itself, but it's not pretty. Uh, and and that's it because terminal our, our, when it hits that error. So is it just you're missing that one chunk or is it like you're missing everything post? No, it's, it's just that that one chunk. So it tries to update everything. And the it, it's partially because the cache is not a write through. We don't write back through the cache, right? Yeah. Yeah. That that would solve it too if we had any way to do a write through cache. That Yeah, the only other idea I had was building a local cache, but having a watch and then checkpointing so out somewhere and getting deltas yeah. and somehow building it local. But I think, you know, in a big environment where you have a lot of endpoint churn, you could hit this and never normalize. Like statistically, yeah. you, you could make it to a point where you never actually normalize the endpoints, but I don't know what the net effect that is in usability. Yeah, if endpoints are consistently changing. Consistently churning. I, yeah. And I've seen it like in ML workloads, like massive yeah. where you just shout it out and then, get, you know, and you're just going like this over and over. And that's why they did, I guess if you lockstep intervals and in caches, maybe your controller with the informer, you could somehow at least snapshot at a, at a given interval where they're in lockstepped. Because I know in the big services, they started doing sharding on like, you only grab this. And I mean, this is what endpoint slice was for. Yeah. But I don't know how if you've got two control loops that are offset and a cache well, sitting between them, you, you, in, it's probability. In this case, where it's not even as bad as that, though, right? There's not two controllers. There's only one controller. It's just we're not writing back through our own cache. So we're writing and then we're the... the, the yeah. The response to that write, the event comes into our watch queue, but we're meantime processing other events, which could be in conflict with the thing that we just wrote. So if we were able to write through the cache, then we would at least see our own updates. That's potentially a problem if there are two controllers, though, right? There shouldn't be for a slice. There shouldn't, there shouldn't, be, shouldn't be. Yeah. 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 I, th I think there should never be a. a the nice thing about endpoint slices is we have that concept of a slice is managed by one entity and one entity only. So that's one little bit of safety we have. What did the API machinery folks say about writing through the cache? Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. that. That was a suggestion of if we can find a way to write through the cache, that would be great. Uh, uh, let me back up and say, uh, the the fix I initially proposed for this is is ugly, but what it was is uh, we already have a tracker that uh, looks at the endpoint slice resource version that we think we should have and compares it to events coming back. So when we see an endpoint slice update, does this match what we already wrote? And if it does, we're good. And so basically I waited until we received events for endpoint slices to basically uh, for every resource version we expected for a service and then triggered the sync. The problem is some of those events could not come through or there could be some issue there. And so I had to have some kind of like timeout where yeah. if nothing comes through, then sync anyways. And I set that as three seconds. That, that, fe that feels like a very gross solution, but it did improve somewhat. But API machinery obviously did not like that. Uh, yeah, and that I'd... that requires us to to track for every service a list of slices and their resource versions that we last touched, right? We're already doing that, but yes, it does. We we have to do that for endpoint slice update events to decide if we need to trigger a sync service. So we we added that to avoid somebody deleting an endpoint slice and us never reconciling based on that. OK. This is a big... Sorry, go ahead. If there's a big question mark around writing back to the informer cache, could you 
keep the informer cache intact, but have a cache of just content you've written. So instead of having to hit the API server, if you see a conflict from the informer cache, um, look in the cache of the content you've written. At that point, I think if you have a conflict, it does mean that something else has changed it. So in that case, how do you decide what to trust? If there's a difference between your local cache and informer cache, do you defer to your local cache? Is, is there a way to, I guess there's a way to determine what was written to most recently between the two? Resource version. Is, is that usually, is that guaranteed to be sequential? It's guaranteed well, to not, be monotonic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't fully alleviate the extra work, but I think that would alleviate like the particular concern that you mentioned around the false positive update failures. That being that actually seems, shown to the user. Yeah, you still have to seems, fail once though, right? You, you'd fail and then check the cat, check the secondary cache to see if there was a patch in there or something, right? I guess you could even check it preemptively. Right. I mean, I, th I think this is getting awfully close to the write through cache concept, but something that you, you just two caches basically and yeah. comparing. It's basically a, 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 a patch list on top of the cache. And yeah. when you see your same resource version come through the cache, you can remove it from your higher level, higher layer. Right. Yeah. Ugh. It does feel like something we could generalize though. Does. Yeah, I can't believe this would be the only place that this problem would occur. Yeah, yeah so you yeah, can, I just... I, I've spent a while looking at this error, error obviously, and it, it happens in most controllers. It just happens in endpoint slice controller way more frequently than other controllers because it just, there's so many things that could trigger this and there's so many resources it's managed. Uh, but yeah, it, it does happen everywhere. So we should probably take this to the mailing list or to an issue. Um, Rob, do you want to explore that last idea? It's, it's not terrible. Um, I wonder what Daniel and API machinery folks would do to us if we proposed that. <laughs> yeah. And the alternative yeah. is implement it, implement it in your endpoint controller, endpoint slice controller, and then you can generalize it later. Yeah. Or, or, or well, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess you could go get Daniel's approval and see. API machinery first or later? I, I mean, yeah. I imagine I imagine what we'd ideally want is Daniel's uh, approval on like, this isn't a terrible idea. And then we'd go do it. And if it turns out it was even better than terrible, better than not terrible, then we could generalize. Aim and high. So so one, what what's the net effect here error wise? Because I think that's the main user facing thing. Are they going to end up with two errors? Hey, I looked at my cache and it was different to your cache. So therefore, I'm going to update with my cache. What are you going to throw back to users? Because as, as it sounds like that error message isn't that useful at the moment. And it's not yeah. actionable. Yeah. So like, yeah. are we going to spit back something actionable or create a more reasonable? Because I think the best outcome is whatever you implement code-wise, does it result in a better user experience that people can act on? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. I think we still want to error when or, or bubble up some kind of event when we're unable to update an endpoint slice. I think we just want to dramatically reduce how frequently that happens. Uh, and so any kind of hopefully this concept would almost eliminate, maybe entirely eliminate this issue. Uh, if if we only have one controller per slice, it should completely eliminate the issue. If yeah. you if you retain the event, it would really indicate somebody else wrote to this slice and I was in a race with it. Yeah. It sounds not terrible to me. Valerie for the win. Yeah. Cool. Nice Thank fun, you. Valerie. Thank you, everyone. All right, yeah, Bridget, you. you've got a note. In ah, yes. So um, Cal uh, made a 
update to the API testing recommendations that I thought was really interesting that we should definitely point out, given how many enhancements are coming out of the SIG right now, which is to say, you should not make an assumption about when you're, say, going from alpha to beta. Don't make any assumptions about your gate being on or off. Be explicit, because that's how you, being explicit is how you avoid unpleasant surprises. And I don't know about you, but in prediction systems I've run in the past, definitely had unpleasant surprises based on um, unexpected assumptions that were different than someone else's unexpected assumptions that were unstated. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting and just a very small update to the SIG architecture uh, documentation there, but something we should all think about for the features that we're pushing forward um, as to exactly how the uh, feature flag makes assumptions. And as we review each other's changes, making sure that the, uh... That, that the flag is explicit as part of the tests when the flags are active. Absolutely. Even though it doubles the number of test cases. Blah. I mean, I'd rather have the test give us valuable information and take a little longer to run, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, just a note there. I was like, oh, that's kind of relevant to exactly what's going on right now. All right, uh, last item on the agenda so far is Tim's procedural improvements for SIG network. So we have a very loose procedure in terms of what we do in, in triage. You know, we, we do this every couple of weeks and in between several people poke at it and, and update their issues, but we don't, have a, we don't have anything really tracking this. If somebody wanted to come in and understand how many open issues do we have and what states are they in of being worked on, like we don't, we don't have a way to answer that, not really. Um, uh, likewise, for pull requests, we don't have a clear state of like, are we waiting for feedback? Are we waiting for changes? Whose, ball, whose court is the ball in? Um, and uh, nor do we really have a process for CAPs. Which CAPs are attached to SIG network and which, which states are they in right now? Now, CAPs are probably the best of all of these because at least there's some tooling that has been worked on, CAPCuddle. Uh, to help us query these things, but um, there, there isn't a dashboard that shows us all the things that are in flight, which this past cycle really kind of hurt me as I was trying to keep track of everything that was going on in the last week of the cap freeze um, and trying really hard not to drop the ball on anybody. Um, and so uh, I talked a little bit with the uh, enhancements folks about the, the number A, the number of hoops that are needed to jump through for enhancements. Um, and we're going to try to figure out if we can reduce the, the number of hoops there. Um, but what other SIGs are doing in these same sorts of problem areas? And so they pointed me to some of the things that other, other SIGs are doing. Um, and again, project boards came up um, as you know a lot of SIGs are using this and, and having reasonable success with it. So I spent some time today um, pulling up project boards and really trying to understand how they work with GitHub and, and what the limitations are. Um, and it's better than I thought it was, um, but it's still not completely uh, automatic. And so um, I guess the, the question that I wanted to just open here is like how, how much pain do other people feel from the lack of these sorts of dashboards uh, versus what other sort of procedural hurdles are we willing to undertake? So for example, we could change our triage process to uh, first thing we do is import all of the new issues into a project board and then triage from the project board, right? Um, that would require a certain amount of discipline in order for us to keep track of those states, right? Like if you're triaging an issue and you ask a question of the uh, original poster, like switching a, one of the labels to like, you know, back in your court or something, right? Just so that we know which state things are in. Um, my own experience from, from me being a lazy and forgetful git uh, is I will often forget to do those state changes. And then we have things in the wrong states, which maybe isn't the end of the world, right? Um, Anyway, I'm talking a lot. I wanted to open the floor for what people think about this and what have they done in the past. And honestly, if anybody's got deep experience with project boards, like I would love to hear the stories. 
we do own Project Board Zero. Is that one ours? Yeah. Um, since other groups are using it, isn't there some automation that's going to be constructed around these? Um, I don't know. Like I'm, I was surprised to find that there isn't a way in GitHub to say automatically add all issues with a label to a project board. It just, there isn't a way to do it. There are like third party GitHub actions that you can install and run, but there's nothing baked into GitHub for that. Are those third party actions useful? Uh, the one that I looked at this the, today, and I don't know GitHub Actions very well, so I, I didn't fully process it, but the one that I looked at was, um, you know, it used some label information to uh, move things into a project board. It wasn't clear to me whether it runs periodically or if it only runs on, uh, on, on first creation or if it runs on every delta. I just don't know GitHub Actions well enough to know, like, what the life cycle would be. And because it was third party, I felt weird about trying it out on our org. I mean, my overall thought is that if we do end up using states of some kind, um, it seems like we're no worse off than we were before if people forget to do things, even if things are in the wrong state. Um, you know, most of the time, somebody would catch that within you know, a week or two, like, it's not that hard to do, also do a quick run over the issues and make sure that the state's updated. Um, and if people remember to update the state as they go through, we will also gradually train people to do that, um, you know, over time. Uh, that seems like at least somewhat of a win. And we don't have to start with a very complex state machine either. In fact, we shouldn't have that. We should just have like one or two or three states so that it's easy to remember to do those things. Yeah, I, the, just from our experience using project boards and other uh, on the gateway, it, we, it feels like the UI is not suited if it gets beyond a certain number of issues. So that is one cautionary thing. Is that an incentive for us to keep the number of issues low in states well, that we have to do something about? That's true, but you also have an event horizon where if you cross it, then it's like hard to recover. Yeah, I saw some limitations that were baked in, like 2,500 uh, issues in a single column. God help us if we hit that. Um, but looking at what like sig nodes set up, like having more than 50 cards in a column is untenable. Like you can't really do anything with it. But you can change the views. I've caveat that I've only done a little bit with this, but what I've seen is you can set a filter and say like, I want to look at this. And then you don't see as many. I just made a few for my team to track PRs and I ran into the same thing. I only have like 10 cards and it was really hard to navigate and move stuff around. I mean, cause you're scrolling sideways. <laughs> I don't know. It's just really annoying. That was just my opinion with it. I wonder if it's just time, right? It's just, we don't spend enough time on this stuff maybe. And anything that we did that forced us to spend more time on this would help. And this could be one of those things, but is there a dumber thing we can do that would, would allow us to spend more time on it? So, like, I don't fundamentally have a problem with the way we do triage for issues now. Like it's not so bad. And as long as we do it regularly, it, it doesn't get too backlogged. Um, what, so I guess the question I, I would ask maybe is what questions are we trying to answer via a change here, right? Maybe lack of a dashboard isn't really a question. It's not an objective in itself. I, I would like to be able to see in one glance, what are all the caps that we have open and what state are they in? Right, so that's that's one. Like, but Kep Cuddle can kind of answer that. What other questions do people struggle with? I have the general question of whether someone's owning the overall direction and of all the stuff that's being done for for Coop Proxy because there's lots of issues and Keps and they kind of cross streams. And 
I'm not really sure. That's like a concrete question that I had. Maybe this would help with that. Maybe it wouldn't. Would it make sense to have, I mean, we can have as many project boards as we need, right? Um, maybe it makes sense to have a separate project board that is just cube proxy and have like one column for caps, one column for issues and one column for PRs. And then you could like for that one component, you can get a view of everything that's in flight. I hadn't thought about it as a component by component thing before. It's not a bad idea. We have pretty well-defined components, at least for a number of things. Yeah, if, the, if there was ownership of those things, maintaining them, then it would work, right? But if we, did, if we didn't maintain those, we'd just have the same problem that we have now. So, but, you know, I, what but if we spend- Is that an argument for sub-maintainers? Yeah, I mean, we, for SIG Windows, um, we had this problem sort of, and I was, I've been doing some stuff with them lately, and I was, we, what we started doing is, meeting up 30 minutes before the meeting for people who want to help manage that stuff. And so there's kind of like a meta SIG meeting where you hang out for like 15 minutes and you just do that stuff. So it just gives us extra time to commit to it, to it. But, um, but yeah, sub maintainers would probably solve it too. There's probably a lot of ways. I mean, we don't have separate meetings for like a cube proxy. We don't have a cube proxy working group meeting or something. Right. Do we, do we need it? That would, just, that would be a solution. I was just asking Andrew what he thought about that this week of what if we just created a sub project for Kube proxy? Um, I, I don't know if anyone else, we both kind of thought, I think it might not be a bad idea. We just, I, I don't know. Yeah, like I think adding to that, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of CNIs in the ecosystem, like implementing their own service proxy. And so Jay had some ideas of, if there, if we can have like a consolidated or unified API that all the proxy people implement, and they're sort of like uh, kind of like conformance, where you can define like what is what you need to implement from a data path perspective to do the proxy properly. And so, I don't know, like maybe that's one thing we can do uh, if we kick off a working group. But I don't know how important people feel that is. Uh, we we are missing something important. Is nobody's taking in paying attention to the tests. I mean, I'm practically managing all the monitoring, all the jobs and have uh, Jay and other people chiming in. But for example, IPBS is the, the, the job that the quality is, is very bad. We have bugs, we have things failing. The Windows proxy, I mean, they have something hard coded that is for UDP. Before going to to start to create subgroups, we should have you know, something stable that we know that we are not going to break anything. Because right now, if we start to to break things down with the current testing, in six months we are going to have a mess. Definitely, definitely agree with. The fact that we, yeah, we just need more. We need we need to spend more time on stuff, I guess. I mean, there are the other day one guy discovered one test. It was running one checking bots against whatever thing. Three, five months running without the the check. So, I mean, we have things that the the Windows proxy code. I mean, they have hard coded something. Mangreen UDP packets or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So we need to stabilize and, and have a control of what we are running and you know, know that we are healthy. And then we can start to, to break down in different groups. But I mean, from other projects' experience, that's what is going to happen. Every group is going to do their own testing. They are all they test their own thing, and that's yeah. a disaster for sure. Currently, right now, if with the coup proxy example, when a test fails, it's tricky to know who to find to get help. So, <laughs> right, like that's one of the. It's kind of a catch twenty two, right? Like 
we have the stability problem. We had. Yeah, but the, I mean, the stability is this is only one solution. Looking at the results and asking. This, I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, there is a lot of people that know a lot. It's, you have voltage, lead it. I mean. And then is how we need to, to learn. And this is the, the best way to learn Kubernetes. You start, to, I mean, I didn't know anything about VPS or nothing two years ago. And now at least I can pretend that I know when the people is talking. So we should have work on that before moving to full development. Okay. Um, we've got just a few minutes left today, so we should probably see if there's anything else that people want to go over. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about how to, or if to use project boards or some other mechanism. Um, I don't feel like we're in a terrible state other than some amount of lack of visibility. Um, but honestly, it's not that bad from where I sit. Maybe I'm just lazy. Well, you're, I think you are absolutely demonstrably not lazy, but I think you're trying to be effective and make good use of time, which is important. Uh, I do question whether project boards, and this is a, something I don't know the answer to, can be used um, across repos because uh, sometimes when, you, like you mentioned, um, wanting to track how a cap is going and like that might be in a different repo then no, they can, you can create or, it over or, in Kubernetes enhancements or something. Anyway, we, yeah, can, like. we can do it across the any repo within the org. Um, I think I was reading the, the limitations this morning. I think you can set up 250 repos in a single okay. project board. Hmm. All right. Yeah, as long as we you, can you, link to things that aren't right there. Yeah, you can either create them on the on the repo or on the org. So there's a whole bunch created on the org. In fact, we have number 10 on the org that I set up at some point or somebody set up at some point in the past and then hasn't really touched since. Right, so those are logistical details. Okay. All right, 10 minutes left. Is there anything else that anybody wants to bring up? I thought Tim had a collection of exciting PRs for us to all <laughs> Could do that. Going I have twice for general agenda items, though, if anybody else has something to bring up really quick. All right, take it away, Tim. All right, well, I'm not sure really what we should do here. There's 120 open PR, 119 open PRs. Um, is it, we're obviously not going to read through them all. Um, there are many that do not have an assignee. So maybe it's worth projecting and just seeing if anybody says, Oh, that should be assigned to me or or something. Sure. All right. Uh, window. All right. So uh, these are in forward order or backwards order, rather. Most recent first. Um, I'm just looking for ones that have no assignee. So SCTC, SCTP support beta. That's probably just docs updates. Um, anybody want to volunteer um, holler? And we'll see if there's just anything egregious in a few I, minutes. I, I can done. take a look into this one. That's just a uh, features comment, features comment. That one is find... all comments, so <laughs> go awesome. ahead. OK. <laughs> do you want me to assign it to you, or do you want to just take it? I can't assign from here, so I'll have to click through to a different window. But wait, do you want to take this one? or? I can take this one. That's uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what number is that? Nine nine one eight nine. Ooh, we're gonna hit yeah hundred thousand this week. Uh, test validate network policy refactoring. Yeah, th this one team is a follow up of a PR that Carlos opened about my endpoint one. So it it's from the good first issue. It's probably worth that, that you take a look at, into if this is what you want. Otherwise, I have suggested to them to use like something simpler than creating closer functions. But, OK, I'll open that and take a look. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a really quick one, even if that's an extra large. 
merge error check to valid import endpoint ports. Anyone knows this one? This isn't super useful without opening it, huh? Uh, yeah, that's, I, I asked it then to, to not do it. Should I send the it to you then? Yeah. So this the problem is that these refactors are making, I mean, it's not giving any benefit. And the problem is to hit problems with pop port, you know. It's just suffering, changing ground, function, from failing to return. Yeah, I mean, yeah I'm I'm not a huge fan of this sort of refactoring because it moves the errors. Oh, I guess it is. It's really literally the same thing every time. Yeah, and the last time that we did something similar, we we forget to update once. So the the E two is is dangerous. Every time that somebody touches something, there is. Hmm. All right. Well, I'll have to come back and think about that too. Automated cherry pick. Uh, that. That one's got a lot of stuff that's not network related, but it does touch a couple of like uh, tests for networking. It's basically a refactor with like 20 different commits in it. And it probably just needs some review, but uh, there's the do not merge cherry pick not approved. Who has the authority to approve cherry picks at this point? Uh, release team. It's only 29 files. Uh, what touches us? Is it just tests? At least tests, like refactors, AGN host image, uh, pod oh. usage and tests. That's one, that third commit in there. Uh, anybody wants to volunteer to take a look? Uh, I we'll get take. If those are tests, I can take. Always Antonio. Um, proxy config tests from Justin. Oh, the actual bug in tests. Look at that. <laughs> Come on. Um, close wait. Another one from Justin. Close wait test. Yeah, this, this is the one that I mentioned. Okay. I, I had but, to talk with him because uh, Wojtek and I modified a different function. So I think that's all right. What's this one, Antonio? This is you. Yeah, I closed that because okay. uh, that. Language fixed fixed it. It's, Jay found that the the second proxy was logging or was IPv6 error. Um, then we should fix it. I'm going to ignore the spelling ones. Cube proxy clear contract. And this is you also. Yeah, this is approved. This is the famous contact team. Oh, it's approved. There we go. Okay. Uh, I should just filter for approved next time. Um, Delete words, forget it. Structured logging migration, modified Docker shim and networking parts. So what should it deal with the logging thing? Uh, they are piece by piece trying to convert to a structured logging formatted, uh, structured not formatted logs. Um, and uh, so they're just asking people who own various sub packages to read and review and make sure that the, the new log structure makes sense. So these sorts of changes are generally pretty easy um, to review. Um, there's just so many of them. Tim, do you know if that means like when we release 1.21, like some parts of the code are gonna use structure logging and some parts aren't? Or is there like a global config that would just enable it or disable it? Uh, there is a global config to disable it, um, but some of, the, some of the log lines through the code base are converted to use ARS and some are using ARF still. Or, or log s and log f, um, no, er error, yeah. Uh, in, info and error s. Um, 
the ultimate goal is that once everything is converted, then we will um, simply make the the switch. And then we can talk about whether we replace K log with something else. Uh, but first, we've got to get all of the call sites switched over. Gotcha. So anybody, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I assigned myself. You assigned this one, Bowie? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I've, I've been reviewing them every now and then. OK. Um, do one more. Oh, this is another another structured logging. Cube proxy. Yeah, send it to me. Oh, it is sent to you. Uh, okay, cool. So we have a lot of open PRs, um, although not so many recently. So I guess that implies that there are a lot of really old ones. Um, maybe it's worth coming back through from the other end next time and seeing how many of these old PRs we should just be closing out. Oh, they're not actually that old. The oldest we've got is only a year and a half. Only. Two years. Two years. Tim, now. I think that's a really good idea. And I think maybe we should build in like a an eight minute or you know, eleven minute or whatever, just a chunk of time, maybe right after triage. Like yeah. give triage 10 minutes and this 10 minutes, and then we're only at 20. And we still have 40 for everything else. I could do that. If we just do a few a few every time, we can chip away at it from the other end, especially if a lot of these are easy to like, if it's been open for a year, are we really doing it or what's going on with it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're at time. Um, anybody have anything else they wanna throw out? Okay, guess uh, that's it then. Thank everyone, I'll hit the stop.